The archives of the Auschwitz concentration camp, published already after World War II, contain many photographs documenting Nazi crimes. Among them is a photograph of a group of midgets sitting around a festive table, surrounded by Nazi officers. Who were these well-dressed little people in disguise, and how did they end up at the same table with their executioners? The Seven Dwarfs The story of the midgets depicted in this photograph goes way back to the late 19th century, to a small Carpathian village called Rosavla in Transylvania. In those days, Rabbi Shimshon Ovitz lived in that village. Despite his small stature, and we want to know that Shimshon was a midget, he made a good living as a toastmaster at weddings. Shimshon Ovitz was known around the village as a cheerful and joyful man, and on top of that he played practically every musical instrument, and with his songs he won the hearts of more than one or two girls. The rabbi had been married twice, and both of his wives were of normal height. He had ten children with both wives, seven of whom were born midgets. And when these children grew older, the enterprising father of the family realized that with such an unusual family, there was a possibility to earn good money out of it. Shimshan decided to create a family troupe of itinerant artists. He began to teach the children songs and jokes, playing different musical instruments, in other words, all the tricks of the street performers. Children learned new skills really fast. Father's genes were showing off themselves, but the old man did not have time to feel happy because of it. In 1923, he passed away. Shimshan's second wife, Basia, took care of further training of the future artists. She ordered miniature violins, guitars, and cellos for the little hands of the children, and strictly made sure that the children would learn to play them. Soon Basia died too, and before she died, she made a vow to the children that they would always take care of each other. After burying their mother, the Ovids decided to go to Europe for a living and called their band the Lilliputian Troop. In 20th century, in the 30s, most European states supported Nazi policies, and attitudes toward Jews were not the most favorable, but the talented family was able to win the hearts of the population. Popular songs and their performances were heard in all languages from Romanian to German. Among the great admirers of the troupe were high-ranking officials who helped the little artists to change their documents, so the Ovids became an ordinary Hungarian family. Duties in the troupe were clearly divided among its members. The more tall, like Arye, Sarah, and Leah, were in charge of organizing concerts, ordering costumes to be sewn in ateliers, and setting up decorations. The more small members of the troupe, Francesca, Rosica, Freida, Miki, Elizabeth, Abraham, and Perla, performed on stage. The number of band members gradually grew, since some of them got married, and all new family members joined the friendly Ovid's team. The family even bought a car to go on tours. All this time, the Lilliputian troupe was doing great. The Road to Auschwitz In 1940, part of Transylvania passed to the Hungarians. The Hungarian government had already at that time supported Hitler's policy toward the Jews. But this had no effect on the Ovid's family whatsoever. They continued to tour as before with false documents. The year 1944 it was a tragic year for the Lilliputian troop as the Nazis occupied Hungary and the Gestapo had no trouble discovering the real origins of the Ovid's family. In March, the troop, along with the rest of the Jews, began to be prepared to be sent to the concentration camp. One of the SS officers at the railway station had a particular liking for the midget group, and so the Ovid's family entertained the Nazis in Hungary for another month. In early May, however, they were loaded onto a wagon and sent straight to the Auschwitz death camp. All the way to the concentration camp, the little artists, well aware of where they were being taken, tried not to lose their courage themselves and did not let the others do that. They sang songs, played instruments, and even handed out invitations to their concert in the camp. For many, it was their last performance in the wagon, but people smiled and even laughed when they saw the funny little people. The Death Factory Auschwitz welcomed the new so-called batch of living material, as usual, with a fine-tuned conveyor belt. Unloading, line-up, inspection, the healthy to the right, the sick and injured to the left, the healthy to the barracks, and the rest to the gas chamber. During his inspection, the SS man noticed a group of amusing little midgets. He took them aside, then contacted Dr. Mengele by telephone and reported that the new batch of arrivals contained material that would be of interest to Mengele. Indeed, he ordered the midgets to be housed in a separate barrack. 
The Ovets even cheered up, because what awaited them as incapable of hard labor was a gas chamber, and here was a separate barrack and exemption from work. For a week the family lived in obscurity, they were not taken anywhere, they were not asked any questions, and they were well fed. But what did it all mean, the artists thought? Why were they separated from the others? What was ahead of them? Now, Dr. Death. A week later, the Ovids were moved to a separate block. As it turned out later, this was where Dr. Mengele kept those whom he wanted to study in detail, to conduct experiments, who, in his opinion, were of interest for absolutely horrific research. The first experiments on midgets were, at first glance, harmless. They took blood samples, asked about their ancestry, found out what diseases they had suffered. The Shlomowitz family of midgets also participated in the experiments alongside the Ovids. The little artists introduced them to Dr. Mengele as their distant relatives. The two families began to stick to each other. Gradually, Mengele moved on to more serious experiments. Not a single day went by that a family member was not brought out of the laboratory on a stretcher unconscious. Dr. Mengele took brain samples from the midgets, irradiated them with radiation, injected a scalding solution into their uteruses, poured boiling water over them, infected them with viruses and watched to see how the little people would endure all this and would they survive after all this. But the little people survived, endured the pains of hell, did not lower their heads when they were displaced naked as exhibits and viewed their genitals. The Ovids always stood with their heads held high and even smiled when they were called cartoon dwarfs. They knew perfectly well that only patients could prolong their lives for a few more days, and so they were patient. January of 1945 The Nazis, realizing their ultimate defeat, were freeing themselves from the evidence. Every day, large amounts of people were driven into the gas chambers. The crematorium chimney, which smoked every day with black smoke, now covered the entire camp with it. The Ovid's family also waited their turn. They sat in the barracks and all sang sad songs together, maybe for the last time. Suddenly, Russian speech was heard outside the windows, and the little people cried. Could it be that the rumors that the Russians were beating the Nazis were true? The entire Ovid's family survived, except for one of the brothers, who tried to escape from the camp because he couldn't continue to witness all those tortures and experiments, but unfortunately was killed by a guard. Post-war period After the liberation, the Ovid's family went to Antwerp. A few years later, they all moved together to Israel, where they toured the country with concerts for a long time. But in 1955, the family opened their own business. They never gave any more concerts. But what happened to Joseph Mengele after the war? Dr. Joseph Mengele, despite his enormous crimes, managed to escape the punishment. He watched the Ovid's family for the rest of his life from Brazil, making notes in his diary. It's hard to believe, but this man lived happily into old age without having to answer for his atrocities and may have lived even longer if he had not had a heart attack. The years spent in a Nazi concentration camp had taken their toll, and from 1970 on, one by one, the Ovid's family members began to pass away. The last to die was Pearlie in 2001. In one of her interviews, she said that if they had been ordinary people instead of Lilliputians, they would hardly have survived the death factory. What other people consider ugly helped them to survive. They remain giants at heart. After their deaths, a book was published called We Were Giants at Heart, about the fate of the Ovid's family. It was written by their compatriots Eilat Negev and Yehuda Koren. The book was translated into dozens of languages and became an international bestseller. Thus, the whole world learned the extraordinary story of the Lilliput family, who miraculously survived in the walls of Auschwitz. Subscribe for more videos.